welcome to uh, this afternoon's edition of the Kolaba Conversations. The topic of our conversation today is on developing an Arabian Sea uh, consensus. And I, of course, have a wonderful panel of speakers uh, with me. Of course, Ambassador Navdeep Suri, former diplomat, uh, Ambassador of India to the UAE, and now a colleague at ORF as well, a distinguished fellow here. Uh, we have with us uh, Epsa Malketri, who is the president of the Emirates Policy Center and member of the Consultative Commission of the Gulf Cooperation Council. Uh, we have Kwame Owino, who is the CEO of the Institute of Economic Affairs uh, from Kenya. And, of course, we have uh, Mohammed Al-Dashan. Good to see you again, uh, Mohammed, who is the MD at Oxfam Frontier Markets and Fragile States. That's fascinating work in some fascinating places. An associate fellow at the Chatham House in the UK. It's really wonderful uh, to be part of this conversation. And just actually, um, before we logged on, um, I was chatting with Ambassador Suri uh, about, uh, you know, the broad contours of this conversation and actually how uh, the idea of an Arabian Sea consensus is really one that's rooted in uh, our geographical and cultural history. Uh, and I think, you know, that's the, that's the overarching theme of collaboration and consensus that I'd like to kind of focus uh, this conversation on. Uh, so why don't we actually start, Ambassador Suri, by bringing the others into our little conversation uh, that we had before this. I mean, we were talking about uh, the kind of people-to-people uh, -people movement, the kind of trade, uh, the kind of cultural exchanges that took place uh, right from the Gujarat to the Malabar coast, all uh, the way up and down uh, that coast with parts of the Gulf and uh, Eastern uh, African nations. Um, so, in a sense, what we're talking about creating uh, should be about reviving, really. Absolutely. Um, uh, my, my, the relationships between um, uh, Mumbai, Gujarat, the Malabar coast, um, and uh, both the Gulf and East Africa uh, go back a very long ways. Uh, in the Malabar coast, uh, you know, um, uh, the trade between the Gulf traders and the Malabar coast uh, goes back well over a thousand years. Uh, Mumbai uh, is a city which was really used to loom large in the uh, consciousness in the Gulf. I think. Uh, if I'm not uh, to exaggerate, uh, that uh, until the 1980s, if there was anyone in the Gulf was asked about one big city that people visited, uh, then that big city was uh, Mumbai, whether it was for tourism, for uh, education, for healthcare, uh, or for business uh, in, indeed. So the links are very old. And I think what we are trying to see is how do you, how does a city like Mumbai capture again uh, that uh, central place that it, it, it had uh, and how do we um, um, build on the uh, relationships that we've enjoyed over the uh, centuries. Um, take uh, Nairobi where, uh, where, where Kwame is uh, as, as a case in point. Um, there's a large uh, community uh, from India um, in fact, the first railway line in, uh, from Mombasa to Nairobi was built uh, during the British period with uh, Indian workers coming in. And even today, whether you go to Nairobi uh, or you go to Dar es Salaam or you go to Kampala, you see a very robust connection uh, that, that exists. And I think as technologies change, as countries move forward in different directions, um, how do we buy, build on those things that bind us? Uh, is it just people? You know, uh, when I was in UAE, I used to often remind uh, people that the India-UAE migration corridor is the second largest in the world after the Mexico-Spain, uh, U.S. Uh, uh, corridor. Uh, there's, there's three million plus uh, persons from India in the UAE. The India GCC trade uh, is larger than the India-European Union trade. It's over $100 billion. Uh, and, and, and so those are some of the things that we can build on. But, you know, taking uh, uh, it, it forward, today you are seeing sovereign funds from the Gulf countries which are looking at investment opportunities in, in India. How do you work on those? And in all of this, there's an underlying current of security. Uh, right. Trade happens, connections happen if people feel safe and secure to travel. 
we've seen the havoc COVID has played in interfering, in inter interrupting those links. So all of those factors, I think, go into this conversation. Right. I think that's uh, some very important points that you've raised. And of course, we can't ever forget that we're having this conversation against the backdrop of a pandemic, even though uh, many of us uh, are beginning to behave as though COVID is over. Uh, it's still very much a part of, uh, you know, our daily lives and the kind of restrictions we face in our movement, the interactions we have. Uh, with colleagues, friends, workers, uh, you know, neighbors, things like that. But I think um, the fact that you made the point about how people will engage much better and more closely on various issues of importance, both uh, strategic, economic, uh, together, uh, is premised in the sense that they feel safe doing so. And I think um, with that, comment of Ambassador Suri's episode, I'd like to get you in uh, to the conversation as well, because uh, when it comes to the security dialogue, for example, I mean, India and the UAE uh, uh, and other other countries in the Gulf as well, um, you know, there, there are engagements that go beyond just the diaspora that goes back and forth, the remittances that go back and forth, but a very, a very real security conversation that's taking place. So, you know, from your perspective, you can elaborate on that. Uh, I think you're on mute. Uh, first, thank you uh, for the invitation and honor to be with you and with my uh, old friend, Ambassador Nadeep. Well, uh, for years there have been repeated calls from my background as a political scientist, as a, as a policy-oriented uh, researcher. Well, for years, there have been repeated calls to establish uh, a collective security system in the Gulf region, the, the Arabian Sea and the Strait of Hormuz. That includes Arab countries, Iraq, Iran, and Yemen. Today, these calls uh, uh, seem to be more urgent than, than ever, uh, as countries all over the world are currently struggling to overcome the negative impact of COVID-19 and, and, and kickstart economic recovery. So this, however, requires regional cooperation and, and collective efforts to diffuse tension and uh, uh, effectivity um, marriage crisis across the Middle East and, of course, uh, the, the Arabian Sea and the Gulf. So this perhaps can can help us to develop a common understanding of growth and uh, prosperity in the Arabian Sea region, the, the Gulf region, and beyond. But it seems hard to talk about development successes, uh, cooperation, uh, to develop common understanding and win-win formulas in the midst of ongoing conflicts, crises, uh, uh, and wars. In the absence of confidence uh, among the uh, out and among the players outside or um, the area, the regional players, so the needs for peace and, and dialogue has even become uh, more urgent today as military solutions have failed to achieve uh, satisfactory result while open conflict have. Uh, uh, aggravated the, the already poor economic situation due, of course, to the COVID-19. Now, if we move to the, to the Gulf Indian economic partnership and, and the security overlapping uh, between the Arabian Gulf and South Asia regions, as well as the decline of the uh, impact of uh, religion and ideology as the determinant in the Gulf Indian relationship, are important motives to cement the strategic partnership between the, the Gulf state, the Arab Gulf state, and uh, India. There are several common issues between the two sides in the field of uh, political and, and diplomatic ties, such as um, fighting terrorism, drug trafficking, crime and illegal immigration. So there are many things to build uh, on. And I will stop here to give my colleague, and uh, maybe I will come. What can be done to enhance that uh, relation between India and uh, and GCC? 
Right. Thank you for that, Abdissam. Um, again, you know, you've given me a good uh, sort of segue to get uh, Mohammed Al Dashan into the conversation because you talk about security and conflict and you know, sort of um, the inability for many parts of the region to actually find peace. Uh, and you mean that in a militaristic, strategic kind of way as well. But, uh, Mohammed, you, uh, from our past conversations, I remember, uh, look at economic development, particularly in fragile states that are, uh, you know, either going through or recovering from armed conflict as well. Now, in your experience in this part of the world, in terms of uh, political flux or military conflict, uh, or uh, other security-related issues, how difficult is it to get economic cooperation off the road in a way that India, a country like India, a city like Mumbai, can actually be an active partner and engage, um, uh, you know, for, for the general prosperity of the region? Um, thank you very much, Ryan. Thank you for having me, and thank you for the great introduction. Um, let me see. Let me let, let me try to answer that by looking a little bit beyond the Gulf, um, and let me let me cross. So I I will not uh, I will not go to East Africa, so I don't step on 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 Kwame's uh, on Kwame's expertise. But I but it was always interesting to look at what is happening in shall we say um, West Asia, North Africa. Uh, so the non-Gulf Arab countries uh, to a large extent, and it's there's something there's something fascinating happening there. Is um, let's say two things. The first one is what kind of partner India hopes to be to uh, to all to all the countries in its in its neighborhood in its extended regional neighborhood, um, and it's interesting because like if you talk to people or if you sort of read the literature a little bit, you realize that India has been carving itself a very clear approach, which has been described as functional and collaborative. Um, it is much more conciliatory. It's much more negotiated than. Um, other other large countries that are seeking to build a foothold in the Middle East, such as China. Um, India has systematically refrained from deploying resource extractive approaches when working with neighbor when, when working with countries in its um, in its vicinity. And this is something that many countries, especially fragile states, as you mentioned, are particularly wary of. We've seen we've seen a number of examples where um, where large investments coming from a place like China have led to a variety of, um, shall we say, sovereignty-defying agreements and, and concerns over, uh, over loss of control over natural resources. So this is not happening with India, and this is, this is something very important for India to capitalize on, um, because as, as we all know, regional cooperation isn't, isn't built in a day, but it, more importantly, it's not built by high-level agreements. It's built by every little... Um, Every little intervention, every little cooperation, every startup between India and a country in East Africa that cooperate, put all of these together. Um, this is this is this is what builds the uh, this is sort of what builds that relationship. So the way forward, I would say for India is um, two things. The first one would be um, diversification. Diversification in the sense that, to a large extent, the relationship of India with the Arabian Gulf is very much about one. Um, Indian expatriates and remittances and two, energy security, right? Whereas if we look at the model of India's relationship with other smaller countries, um, these relationships are much more diversified and this is very much the way forward. The second thing would be for India to continue engaging on its current path of deepening bilateral relationships. Uh, it's, it's great from looking from where, from where India is standing um, to look at all this region as, as one, but my impression being on the other side of the mirror for that is that India's bilateral approach is probably the most efficient one and the one most condu conducive to long-term long -term relationships. Right, okay. So, I mean, you, you've given an entry to Kwame as well to into the conversation because, you know, Kwame, uh, he says he didn't want to step on your toes and talk about countries in uh, East Africa. And, you know, from the Kenyan perspective, really in terms of cooperation, in terms of, you know, Mahmoud says that it's a collaborative, conciliatory uh, approach as well that, that sort of dominates conversations across the Arabian Sea. Um but one important conversation is on, you know, we're talking about sort of coastal states, littoral states, the kind of sea trade, maritime uh, interaction that can take place. In, in your um, research, in your area of study, in your interactions, uh, how much of a primacy do you think 
that aspect of a partnership is given, uh, you know, given the geographical reality. Thank you. Um, and thanks for the invite. I think, I think let, let's start with the history. And now that you mentioned the history, I think it's important. Um, so there's no way we're going to mention um, India's um, relationship with uh, African states generally and the East African seaboard specifically without thinking about China. Um, not for a bad reason, but for two reasons. For the first reason is that, well, China has made a big uh, diplomatic search on the African coal, I mean the African country in Africa. And one of the things it states, especially for Kenya, is that um, there are old, uh, there's archaeological evidence, old evidence of actually China having had, or the Chinese goods having been sent to the African uh, coast in about the 12th century. And some of that looks contrived, a little bit of it is true, but we know Kenyans who live here and whose parents have had four generations of Indian existence. So the idea of India as a partner to Kenya, I mean, I say this respectfully, is more real to living Kenyans than the question of, 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 of the Chinese one. And that's not to say there should be competition. I'm simply saying it's more salient to a Kenyan saying that, look, we've had relationships of trade, of education, uh, of cultural exchange um, with, 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 uh, with India because it's more salient. So that's the first part. I think the second part is that, yes, um, um, India is not seen as threatening or very assertive. And more importantly right now, I think um, the, the significance of, 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 of Indian development, I mean of Indian cooperation with African states, uh, both for, for the purposes of trade, but also uh, the fact that most African countries, Kenya included, um, have most of the medicines, especially in the, in, in, I mean, the pandemic has reminded us about how most of Kenya's pharmaceutical products uh, represent Indian investment in Kenya, Indian farm investment in Kenya, sorry, Indian farm investment in Kenya, but also direct imports from India. In addition to the fact that very, very many Kenyans, and I think this was a good thing because the diplomatic relations were maintained, many Kenyans seek to actually go to India for medical treatment, even when that treatment is available in Kenya because and the quality is higher and also the cost is effect i mean is um is, is competitive so starting with all that uh, and the fact that uh, that uh, that india's government diplomatic um, i think they could actually give it a boost put it on steroids but the fact that it starts from those advantages suggests uh india's role on the continent and even globally at the un and all that is seen as actually more respectful uh more collaborative so I actually confirm what all my colleagues have stated and that and the possibility of strengthening those, starting with Kenya, East Africa generally, into the rest of, of Africa, is a more realistic prospect and will actually have less resistance, in my judgment, than we have seen with Chinese, for both good and bad reasons. Um, I mean, the Chinese problem actually right now is, 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 is reflected unfairly on the fact that many African countries loaded themselves with debt unadvisedly, um, and many people are blaming China for this. Partly um, um, uh, are justified, but maybe that's, that's the common uh, perception that Chinese companies are going to have to deal with. Thanks. Right. Uh, that, the Ambassador Suri, let me come back to you with that, actually, because, you know, this idea of uh, the uh, sort of Sino-Indian dance that goes on uh, all over the developing world, certainly in the South Asia region, parts of Africa, uh, for, um, uh, you know, some sort of stake. Uh, yet, at the same time, I mean, in, as Kwame is pointing out, in Kenya or other parts of uh, certainly the Eastern African seaboard or even other African countries that are not necessarily part of this Arabian uh, consensus that we may want to revive, um, the fact is that dealing with that counter is a real issue for India and Indian industry and Indian infrastructure and Indian governments and certainly Indian diplomats like you all the time. So, you know, what is... What is the way to kind of be in the same space and yet keep your own um, position secure while doing so? Uh, if I go back around 15 years, uh, I used to head the Africa desk in our Ministry of External Affairs. And the Prime Minister's office had asked me to do a paper on this thing of what China is doing in Africa and how we should respond to it. And in that, uh, in the conclusion, I had said that it is neither possible nor desirable for India to try and emulate China in Africa. Uh, we should play to our strengths. We are a different society. We are a different system. We are a different economy. 
Uh, and, and as Kwame mentioned, our relationships are very different uh, in, in Africa. Um, what I would say is, you know, while we have some really good stories to tell in Africa, perhaps we haven't done enough uh, of that storytelling from our side. Uh, I remember Kwame and my, I spoke once about uh, a major project that Indian assistance has executed in uh, Nairobi and, uh, and very few people know about it because we uh, are not that good at publicizing uh, the, the good work that we uh, do. But I want to build upon this idea also that if we are to play to our strengths, which means that unlike, a, let's say, Chinese model, which is a very state-led, state-driven uh, a model where state-owned banks come and give soft money and state-owned enterprises come and execute the projects. I think our strength is people. Uh, and, and what I want to try and develop, uh, and, and here at ORF, uh, we, we are trying to work on this, is can we go beyond the government-to-government -government paradigm of uh, uh, development cooperation? Can we bring in, for example, some of our tech companies that are doing outstanding work in education and in healthcare? Can we bring in uh, some of our leading uh, civil society players, uh, Pratham, for example, in the field of education, or uh, um, uh, others in the field of healthcare? Can we bring in some of our amazing startup entrepreneurs, uh, uh, social entrepreneurs who are uh, doing work at the grassroots? The work that they are doing, is it replicable? Is it scalable? Can we create a lighthouse uh, which not only emits good ideas in terms of platform, uh, but can we create a platform that absorbs some of the ideas from Kenya, from Ghana, from United Arab Emirates or Egypt or elsewhere of success stories and, 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 and see, can we create a knowledge sharing base? I think that's where India's strength is to, to uh, build on our, uh, on our uh, people to people connections uh, and, and leverage some of the uh, work that is happening not just in government. I think the government-to-government -government relations can stay an important part of the project, but, but to develop uh, in areas that go well beyond uh, government interventions. Okay, um, Mohammed wants to come in there, but just before I come to you, I just want to make an announcement for all the people who are tuning in to watch this conversation uh, on building an Arabian Sea consensus as part of the Kolaba conversations that ORF Mumbai uh, has curated and is hosting. Please send us your questions. Our panelists will be happy to answer them. Uh, so, so don't hesitate. Uh, yes, Mohammed, you wanted to come in? Yes, I, I did. There were, there were two points I wanted to follow up um, hmm. on Ambassador Suri's points. One I will agree with, and one with his permission I will disagree a little bit. Um, the first one is about visibility. And I agree with you that India's presence, especially everything that has to do with cultural and technical cooperation in um, in the region, in the Middle East, in, 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 the, in East Africa, is very poorly advertised. Um, I mean, we have, we have to realize that the ranges of cooperation that happens, and I'm, I'm not going to repeat your point about private businesses because I entirely agree, but even government to government or government to uh, non-profits, includes things as diverse as setting up computer labs in regional universities to providing diplomat training. Um, to, to, to diplomats from the region. And all of this is entirely under the radar. So there's definitely an important point of, of, um, of visibility that is. I will, however, I want to point out something that I thought was, was very interesting, and I don't know if the ambassador will agree with me. I entirely agree that you don't want to compete with China because you have a different model. However, um, there is a very interesting little advantage that I've sort of come to realize from talking to... Um, to investment and to, you know, to foreign direct investment and to investment professionals in countries in the Middle East is the very different styles of negotiators they work with. Um, and what is fascinating is that there's like almost, there's like an almost common consensus uh, across countries um, that dealing with the Chinese negotiators, particularly with the Indian negotiators is in, 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 in we're talking FDI, we're talking um, investment, we're talking trade deals. Um, Indian negotiators are much more straightforward, much more better organized in the terms of their presence in countries with trade offices and whatnot, um, and definitely a lot more transparent. 
so there is a strength here uh, that is worth capitalizing on. Um, I agree that this, like, that India has a very different path uh, to development and cooperation than China, but there are definitely areas where India can very much sort of elbow a little bit and you know, take its position um, better than it currently does. Thank you. Right. Okay. You you want to come in on that, Ambassador Suri? Very very just, quick. Just, just, a just a very just just yeah. a very quick one to say. I didn't say we won't compete with China. I said we wouldn't emulate China. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I I want to say that we will compete, but on our strength, on our terms. Entirely right. agree, sir. <laughs> okay. At this time, why don't you you know you come in on that as well because the sort of uh, rivalry um, for um, uh, for. I mean, I don't want to say dominance or hegemony, but certainly to carve their own space and, and strengthen their own relationships uh, uh, that, that India and China both have in terms of a real rivalry that plays out on, um, on the diplomatic stage in parts of uh, the Gulf as well. Um, what do you make of what uh, Mohammed Al Dashan is saying, that when it comes to Indian negotiators, they have an upper hand in terms of organization, in terms of intent and things like that, and yet, uh, there is obviously some lacuna there. Well, if we are talking about, uh, it's not only China and India. You will add uh, the American, you add the, the Russian, you add the European, if it comes to, to Africa, for the Arabs. So all the players are there and they are competing, okay? For uh, small countries like us, how to adapt this, this, this competition? Uh, it's hard uh, for us to take a choice for, for Gulf is their American allies, okay? But if I want to, 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 to go further with our relation with India and, and, and uh, how, how can we move with this, uh, with this relation? I think the, 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 the common uh, dangers, threat, uh, and security challenges compel the two sides to cooperate at the security and the strategic levels. Mm. The security of the waterways is on the top of the list of common security priorities uh, for both sides. The, the advances achieved by, by the Indian fleet have contributed to, to bolstering India's ties with, with, the, with the regional countries as, as part of called the um, maritime diplomacy, which helped New Delhi to develop uh, its defense ties with regional countries by, by, by securing trade routes and maritime boundaries. So we, we can, what can be done on a number of fronts to move that uh, uh, relation, here I'm talking, I'm representing GCC, GCC, uh, Indian relation from, from the domain of the trade and, and, and oil into the domain of multi-dimensional strategic relationship. Hmm. The, the, these axes uh, include uh, working on establishing a, a free uh, trade zone uh, between the two sides uh, according to certain terms of uh, to, to maximize common gains for all sides and uh, admitting GCC states into uh, Indian Rim uh, Association for reasons related to uh, the nature of this block and, and its uh, future uh, impact on, on regional uh, balances in the Indian Ocean and, and security environment uh, in the Gulf region as an extension to the Indian Ocean region. Now, what can be done? What do we, I mean, there is there is constructive steps it can be done by both sides, the Gulfers and the Indian. Now, establishing a higher council for GCC uh, Indian affairs with a, a clear institution institutional structure that guarantee its. Uh, effective role in developing bilateral uh, relations, uh, launching a strategic dialogue with the New Delhi to guarantee the security in the West Asia uh, region and, and the po possibility of playing intermediary roles between strategic rivals in the region uh, to prevent the, a direct military 
uh, confrontation, uh, confrontation that, that, that can adversely affect the security and vital interest of all the parts, especially now, you see, uh, with this tension between the Israeli and the Iranian and, and the American, and of course, securing the, the, the energy, uh, uh, waterways, it's, it's, it's a must for India. I mean, now, uh, what I find that sometimes India, uh, not like what Muhammad said, it takes time to calculate. Oh, for the Indian, either they step in or they just wait. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, because the chances does not wait for you. You have right. to step in. And I'm, I'm not talking about competition. I'm talking about opportunities there. You have to grab it. Right. Okay. Kwame, why don't you come in on that as well? Because, I mean, uh, A, opportunities you have to grab. But perhaps, you know, what Eftisam is saying... Um, is, is a grand scheme of partnership, right? Uh, where you're doing this on all fronts, you're tackling every uh, potentially contentious issue at the same time, you're taking on, uh, you know, global players all at the same time. Do you think that there is perhaps a, a I don't want to say smaller, but a more uh, effective and uh, incremental way to go about it? For example, creating partnerships between cities along the coasts. Uh, between East Africa and India, um, you know, uh, like do, doing something like that along those lines where you look at particular kinds of interaction, trade, technology, uh, digital partnerships, security partnership, but, but keeping the focus, you know, going from small to large rather, rather than the other way around. Um, I mean, agreed. Uh, so, so I think India has um, um, an advantage that actually, um, uh, in my view, um, would be, I mean, or rather, would gel naturally with the uh, African sentiments. And here I'm talking about citizens. So there's a, there's a two, there's a, there's a, there's a survey that's carried every two years. It's called the Afro Barometer. And one of the things that it's shown over the last uh, 15 years or so, I think a little less, is African people. I'm not talking about African governments. African people are great fans of democracy. At least has stated. Uh, and, and 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 India as a democracy tells you one thing, that look. Democracy is an efficient way of managing diverse societies, and African societies are very diverse. Mm. So the, I think that is something India should stress a little bit more, because democracies tend to work through institutions, and so coming to Ipti Sam's point, basically, I think India needs to be capable, or rather, uh, I think it is capable, but it needs to stride a little bit more about solutions that come through negotiations and institutions providing problems, whether they're strategic, whether they're mediation problems, which African countries need quite a bit right now, and even uh, whether global commons and global infrastructure, um, as the pandemic has, 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 has shown to us. I think that's something India could strive at a little bit more. Right. Whatever might be, and I'm sorry to bring us back to China, but whatever might be, many African people interpret China's uh, role in the continent, sometimes unfairly, to be honest, as entirely commercial. Which is not bad, but uh, people see then. I mean, given the colonial antecedents, many people think that a country that is only focused on commercial comes with some exploitation. Whether that's true or not is something that we can debate. But I think, as you say, um, India doesn't stress enough that we too are a very complex society. We are a very large society, and the only thing that keeps us together efficiently, I say efficiently, not because efficiently and rather effectively, is a democratic culture. Uh, which is still under development, no doubt about it. But actually, I cannot imagine India being alive if it had chosen, if it had chosen a different model. Of course, some of your neighbors tried something different, and the results are quite interesting. Right, okay. Um, we have about 10 minutes left, so I'm going to take in a few audience questions and, uh, you know, and then try and quickly wrap it up. But let me club a couple that have come in together, which are essentially talking about enhancing the security of the Arabian Sea region uh, and considerations over... Uh, international energy security, regional and international energy security, that's one. And I mean, I guess you could argue that in a sense it's tied to this because we're talking about international partnerships. Um, you know, would there be some mechanisms perhaps to integrate as far as India is concerned, because in a sense it is a bridge nation between, uh, you know, the Arabian Sea, the Gulf countries and, uh, and East Africa and, you know, the West, so to speak, and, uh, and the East, the Bay of Bengal and the other partnerships that take place on that side uh, of India's coast, is there a way, uh, Ambassador Suri, perhaps you'd be best placed to answer this, to integrate the security concerns and issues along 
the literal cities and the literal um, uh, regions uh, in you know surrounding India? Uh, look, I think uh, there is a growing recognition in India itself that uh, um, this is our extended neighborhood, and we must contribute to security in the region. Uh, we've done that very effectively when it came to piracy uh, around along the Somalia uh, coast, for example. We deployed some fairly serious naval resources, uh, and they had an impact. Uh, more recently, and uh, Dr. Itisam would recall that uh, about a year and a half back, when there was a, a lot of tension in the Gulf, uh, um, and the Americans were there, and the various uh, uh, naval assets uh, or shipping assets had been targeted uh, uh, in the Gulf. There was a genuine fear that um, uh, are we looking at a situation where energy supplies could get disrupted because of the situation that existed. And India deployed two naval vessels in the Gulf. What we did was, we, we said they are not going to be under the, the American umbrella, which is what I think the Americans were saying, that let's all coordinate. But we said, we are not free riders anymore in the international security system. We are willing to contribute uh, from our side. And, and the presence of those two naval vessels in the Gulf, even if it was for escorting Indian merchant ships and Indian tankers and giving them that uh, extra feeling of security. I know that our friends in the Gulf and UAE uh, very much appreciated uh, that we were. So I'm giving you two specific examples uh, of uh, areas where India is showing the uh, willingness and ability to contribute to maritime security because it matters to all countries along the littoral. Right. Does anybody else want to come in on this question as well? Because from your perspective, do you think that India can act as a bridge between, uh, you know, the two sides, uh, so to speak, of the water surrounding it? Would that bridge impact how uh, countries in the Arabian Sea region also would interact with, you know, those further east? Well, you know, if, if you look to the west of India... Uh, yeah. Whether it is the Gulf or it is the eastern uh, seaboard of uh, Africa, the reality is that India is by far the largest country in terms of economy, population, size of armed forces, navy, etc., etc. Yeah. Et so, uh, so I think, uh, but I'm sure Dr. Tissam might have something else. Yeah, to say. you want to come in on that as well. So go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, well, specifically, I'm talking now here about Iran. Okay, mm -hmm. and India has a a good relation with Iran and a very good relation with GCC as well and can play a mediator role here and we've been, been, I've been raising this issue with my Indian colleagues through conferences, through meetings that uh, uh, how can we all be engaged in that uh, economic uh, alliance between all of those in the Arabian Gulf and, and, and GCC and how can we move from zero uh, some game which we are uh, logged in it now to win-win formula situation that everybody can a winner but you cannot take everything and to show that advantage now we have India and so that the benefit it has from, from and the advantage by having that good relation with with the uh, with the GCC from our side Okay, you have you have also that your relation between you and Pakistan, and we have enjoyed good relation. That we can also convince uh, the Pakistanis that also to be part of that. How can you, I would say, freeze the the the, the conflicts in in the region? This is needs to have when I'm saying that we have that kind of council involving. Uh, India involving Pakistan, involving Iran, involving the GCC and those on the Arabian that because we did not gain a lot from conflict and crisis and wars in the region, can we move to the other side and what is the benefits? Okay, and India also can 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 work on the uh, confidence building measurement from both uh, sides and to give an example. Uh, and I think COVID-19 shows that what can be, you cannot work alone in the world. You need the others. Yeah. 
That's right. In fact, that's a good, uh, good uh, sort of um, a point that you've raised. That you know, even though we have seen the world shrink in a sense, we've not been able to travel. We've not been able to uh, interact as freely with other parts of the world as much as one uh, has been accustomed to. Um, this the same pandemic has sort of brought front and center the need for global cooperation. That's a very, extremely good point. And I think on the issue of vaccines and vaccine distribution, vaccine diplomacy, as we like to call it, uh, Kwame, do you think that there is any, uh, what, are the, what is the scope? There must be scope. What is the scope, do you think, for partnership on the healthcare front, given uh, the nature of the pandemic, given the fact that um, countries in the African continent, countries in the South Asian region, have dealt with different public health crises of different scales, even before COVID-19 uh, came, came to the forum, that allows us or gives us some kind of experience that maybe the rest of the world could benefit from. Oh, yes, I think, yes, I, I think that countries in um, South Asia and obviously in, um, in, in, in the Af Sub Saharan Africa as well uh, had some lead time in the sense that uh, there was very clear evidence that something really nasty was happening in Europe and North America. And so people went into not exactly lockdowns. In some places, there were lockdowns and all that. So those precautions, they helped. Of course, there are many other variables that everybody claims. Part of it is the weather, the humidity and all this. But all these put together, I think um, the situation is touch wood, still much, much better than we'd have, we'd have to have. Uh, but I think what it brings us to in terms of global commons, and again here, I mean, we seem to be piling everything in India's uh, uh, to-do list. Um, I, I, I mean, I think a more constructive conversation about how to ensure that vaccines are actually distributed efficiently globally. Because as we understand, the, the, the pandemic has just made it clear to us that it doesn't matter if we have everybody vaccinated in North America and Europe, uh, because global commerce needs to take place and people have to fly one way or the other. It's going, it's going to become a really, really messy thing. So one way about how do you regulate people who wish to travel and how do we ensure that there's some proper evidence that uh, vaccination has taken place is one thing for airlines and aviation, but the second bit is uh, basically how do we scale up gl global vaccine production? And I think right. India has a role because India is the foundational pharmaceutical industry that could be used with global investment to ensure that it's available because otherwise Africa and a few other countries are really, really at the back end of the queue and it will not be a good uh, outcome for the whole world if that was forgotten. Uh, Mama, do you want to come in on this as well, on the issue of sort of uh, co cooperation around the pandemic and mitigation of it uh, in terms of vaccines, in terms of other other healthcare protocols, drugs? Ha uh, happily, happily. So, um, I mean, there are there are already several examples of what Kwame was, was just describing. South Africa has received its first shipment of Indian-made uh, vaccine that's, that was made, uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine made by the Serum Institute of, of India. Just last night, Nigeria was uh, announced that they received a dossier from India uh, to likewise uh, consider purchasing vaccines from there. And throughout the past year, India has sort of had a few examples of, of COVID diplomacy, shall we say, sending a few doctors to, uh, to Kuwait and sending, I think it was hydroxychloroquine, I'm so glad I pronounced that co properly from the first time, um, to Jordan at some point. Um, but it's it's important like it's important to remember that right now we don't just have it's not just the COVID crisis but there's a COVID crisis and there's also another one that is very relevant to the Gulf which is um, the oil prices crisis right so these crises together um, very much put the onus on every country chiefly India but also all the others to sort of review what is it that they can do on the short on short medium and long term to sort of realign their prior, their regional priorities. Um, but yes, in the short term, very much health, healthcare cooperation and, 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 uh, and COVID cooperation is, is key and definitely needs more. It needs to be done more of it, but also more visibility for what is done. Right. I think we really have just a minute left, so I'm going to conclude it uh, with uh, Mohamed's uh, comments. But as I was saying before, when we started uh, was discussing with uh, Ambassador Suri, in my reporting days, I had... Uh, done a documentary from an archaeological dig in the Malabar coast uh, where uh, they're sort of looking for the lost port of Muziris, uh, which dictated and dominated trade between uh, Arabian and Gulf countries and, and the rest of India. So, you know, while uh, Muziris was uh, sort of trading in gold and ceramic and jewels and things, I think 
the jewels of today are tech and uh, vaccines and drugs and things like that. And maybe, you know, the search for Muziris might come full circle, not just from the archaeological dig, but to this uh, screen of boxes of the Kolava conversations today. So thank you all very much for being a part of this wonderful and engaging conversation. Uh, I always say that the best diplomacy is that which is rooted in the, in the exchange of ideas and people. And I think the Arabian example is no better example for that. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Such a delight. Thank you very much.